Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about the song of the 144,000. Now, we're here in the book of Revelation, chapter 15, and we're looking here at verse 3, where it's talking about the song of Moses. But let's go back to chapter 14, getting into a little bit of the background before we get into what I believe is the song of Moses. So we're looking at Revelation chapter 14. Verse 1 says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written in their forehead. Okay, now, this is going to be a little bit of an advanced level class as we try to get our heads wrapped around what's going on here. First of all, we need to understand that when he's talking about these 144,000, he's actually talking about people, a certain people that he has set aside for these end times. These are the people who, after all of these catastrophic events take place and the earth is both humbled and confused, these will be the father's troop, his army, who will come forward to teach everybody the way we are supposed to live making us understand why it was we had to go through such a tribulation in the first place so that it will never happen again. These will be the new Noahs going forward. They're somewhere now getting prepared. They're studying, they're learning. They are already being humbled as they get ready to take their rightful positions. But anyway, let's go on. Verse two says, and I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And then verse three says, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. So this is going to be the meat of this video of this class here as we talk about what this new song is. But just as an aside note, because we are talking about the 144,000, let's come down here to verse four and let's clear a few things up. It says, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. This right here is not talking about sexual preferences or procreation for that matter. What he's talking about is the harlot churches of the world, the world that are teaching fornication. They're being called virgins because they haven't polluted themselves with the false doctrines of the world. They haven't been fornicating with false gods. So you have to understand our husband that we are waiting for is the Christ. And you can't imagine him wanting to come back to a bride that has spent all of her time instead of adorning herself and getting ready for that day, but actually spent time down in the harlot's house doing wickedly. Well, that's why it's important to be of this virgin type. But anyway, let's come back to verse three. It says, and they sang as it were a new song. And we learned over in chapter 15 that it was the song of Moses. So when I do a search in the KJV for the terms song and Moses used in the same verses, we get five hits. One is from Exodus chapter 15 and verse one, where Moses and the children of Israel sang a particular song of triumph as they came out of Egypt after they crossed the Red Sea. But that would be considered an old song since the children of Israel sung it with Moses. Just like that, what we find over in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now, the last video that I did on the Song of Moses, this was the one that we talked about. But I believe that we're going to find that there is yet another Song of Moses, one that would be much newer than these ones that we read about in the Torah. But now when we come back to Revelation chapter 14, we can see a few hints here. It says that this new song they sang before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. Now that's an important hint because those two songs that we heard about in the Torah mention nothing about thrones or these four beasts or even the elders. 
then notice right here in verse three, where it says, and no man could learn that song, but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. So why would it be difficult to learn this new song if we can read about the song in Deuteronomy chapter 32 or in Exodus chapter 15? I mean, I'm sure by now people could have memorized those two chapters and memorized the song. But here in Revelation chapter 14, it's saying that nobody could learn this song except 144,000. These who, like in verse 5 says, in their mouths was found no gal, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So now let's go over to chapter 15 where we see in verse one is talking about these seven angels having the seven last plagues filled with the wrath of God. But then in verse two, it goes on to talk about these 144,000 again. Let me read it. It says, and I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. So therein how we can make the connection because over there we saw that they were harping with their harps. So we know we're talking about the same people. But then notice right here that it says they had gotten the victory over the beast. See, you have to understand when the book of Revelation mentions the beast, unless it's talking about the four beasts, what it's talking about is the governments of the world, like we read about over in the book of Revelation. We are now under the fourth beast, which is different than them all because it comprises of the 10 federated nations, meaning this beast now is global. But the 144,000 will overcome this beast. And to overcome this beast simply means that they're not dependent on him for their food, clothing, or shelter, which is important because when the world goes through that humbling process, the people who are dependent on the beast for their survival now are going to be dependent on the beast for their survival then. And so you have to think, how do they plan on clothing and feeding and sheltering these millions of people who could actually survive these catastrophic events? In other words, you're not going to find any of these guys down at the FEMA camps. And then it's talking about the image of the beast, meaning that they're not tuned in to the picture of this beast like you would see on television. And then it says that they have the victory over the mark and the mark is related to the calendar, the feast days. When we perform the feast of our Lord, we get the mark of our father. Well, the opposite is true too. When we perform the pagan feasts, we have the mark of the beast. And then it's talking about over the number of his name. And I can't say I got my head wrapped around that one completely yet. So y'all help me out down in the comment section as to what that's talking about. So these are some of the characteristics of this 144,000 having harps of God. But then you look at verse three, it says, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. And they sang the song of the lamb saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. This along with verse four would be the song of the lamb. Verse four says, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou art only holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgment are made manifest. So that there is a song. Again, that's the song of the Lamb. But where is this song of Moses? We've ruled out Exodus chapter 15 and Deuteronomy chapter 32 because everybody was singing those songs, whereas this song would be a new song. Well, one thing that came to me yesterday and inspired me to do this class was to look for Moses in the book of Psalms. Because we understand that the word Psalm, by definition, is a sacred song or hymn. So if Moses sang a sacred song, shouldn't it be included in the book of Psalms? 
Well, it turns out there is one psalm written by Moses, and that's Psalm 90, which is a prayer of Moses, the man of God, it says. Moses is mentioned other times in the book of Psalms, but he's only mentioned. There's not one that he wrote like Psalm 90. So Psalm chapter 90 is definitely a candidate for the song of Moses. The only question is, does it fit the description given in the book of Revelation? For instance, how in 14 and 3, he says he sung this song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. So let's take a look at Psalms 90. The first verse says, Lord, thou has been our dwelling place in all generations. But herein lies the issue. This word Lord right here. When we come to the interlinear Bible, we see the word used there, concordance number Hebrew 136, and is Adonai or Adonai. This is the word all throughout the Bible, which we see called Lord. And then right beside it, when it's given a description of the song, where it's saying a prayer of Moses, the man of God. When we look here for the word God, it has Elohim or concordance number Hebrew 430, which is used for the word God most of the time. But here is one thing we have to understand about this word Elohim, is it doesn't necessarily mean the God that we think of. In fact, when you look down here in the definition of the word, you see that the word Elohim is actually plural. So this word should have an S on the end, as in God's, again, because the word is plural. It's the plural form of the word in concordance 433, which is pronounced Eloah. So the being that this word is plural, that's a hint that is pointing to those other figures that we were reading about in Revelation chapter 14. Now, like I said at the beginning of this video, it's going to be a little bit complicated as we understand these other figures that's being talked about in Psalm 90. But it's only complicated because of what we read about over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, where it's talking about how we have been fed with milk and not strong meat, meaning that we weren't really ready for all that it is that we are to know. Verse 2 says, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. The problem is, is the times that we're in, we're going to have to learn to eat this meat really quickly. There's so much going on in the world that if we don't learn to eat this meat really quickly, we're going to have a difficult time going forward. Hebrews chapter five says the same thing. Verse 12 says, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. This is talking about all of those really smart sounding people that you'll hear down in the comment sections of some of these videos. They try to sound really intelligent as they describe some of this stuff, trying to sound like teachers. But you notice here, it says that instead of them being teachers, it says they have need of some to teach them. And what it is that they need to learn, the principles that we found back in the oracles of God, talking about the Torah laws and all of that. These same people that sound so smart and so intelligent are the same people that are quick to tell you that you don't need to follow the commandments or the laws. This is why they have a need of a teacher. This is why they need that milk and are not ready for the strong meat. Verse 13 says, for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a baby. So we don't really have time to worry about these babies in the word. They have their own honor with the Lord. The thing we just need to do is make sure they don't hold us back. You can imagine going down there to the church while some of you are spending hours in the scripture a day or sitting beside other people who only think about our father on Sunday morning, but yet the preacher is expected to teach both of you guys. 
And what are you going to get? Milk. But anyway, let's go on. Verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So now we have to wonder, who is he talking about here when he says, thou art God? When we look at Psalms 90 verse 2 in the interlinear, we see that for the word God, they have concordance number 410, which is comprised of two letters with the transliteration of L, meaning that's how we try to pronounce the word as saying L. But the problem with that, guys, is that these are two letters, so it should have two syllables. Hebrew is not like English, where two letters can make a word with one syllable. So when you look closely over here, at that first letter, which is Aleph, and then that second letter, which is Lamed, this is where you get the word Allah from. You have the A sound with Aleph and the L sound with Lamed, when you put those two together and make a two syllable word, you come up with a ah, la. And this is why it's important not to speak on things that we don't know about. I too may have been guilty in the past, I say in my humility, because many of us have said bad things about the word Allah simply out of ignorance. We didn't know that what they were doing was pronouncing or using the proper pronunciation of those two letters, Aleph and Lamed. And before you pay too much attention to this letter up here, Aleph, and somebody put in parentheses that is silent, then where would you get Abba from if the letter is silent? The pronunciation of Abba would just be B. But anyway, let's go on. Now that we've been educated in where the word Allah comes from here in Psalms chapter 90, one thing we would notice is that this is not the name we recognize as the Most High. That would be what we call the Tetragrammaton, and we won't see it till we get down to verse 13. Again, they're using the transliteration of Yahweh, but what we recognize as that YHWH or Yahweh is concordance number 3068. And don't be confused when you see them splash this V in here. That's because this is coming from the Jewish community who were bred and raised in Germany. That V is a German thing. They don't really have the W sound in German. And the closest thing that they have in German is the V sound. Their Ws make a V sound. Their Vs make a F sound, like fo. And their W's make a V sound. But anyway, neither one of those are correct. It's actually the Wa sound. But anyway, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let's come back to Psalms 90. Here in verse 2, it's saying, Thou art God. But it's not talking about the Most High God. And this is why we had to go through the whole strong meat part. Because we have to get to the point where we realize what the Elohim is really talking about. Why there's a word Elohim and why is it plural? You got so much going on in the Old Testament. So many of these spiritual characters, some of which sound like really bad entities, killing thousands and thousands of people. We have to realize that that wasn't our father. That wasn't the Yahweh Wahe the supreme being, but other Elohim, other lords, other angelic figures is what it boils down to. And that's what sets this song different, is that it's actually going to speak to many of these lower level Elohim, like this one that is talking about here in verse 2, where it says, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever that has formed the earth, and the world from everlasting to everlasting thou art God these other entities that we're going to find out these Elohim were here before the creation of the world this is who the father was talking to when he asked if he would create man 
in the first place. These Elohim already existed before the planet was created. But anyway, verse 3 says, Thou turneth man to destruction, and says, Return, ye children of men. So this is why it's important to make this distinction. You see how it says here, Thou turneth man to destruction? Our Father does not do that. He's not going to turn us to evil or turn us to our destruction. He is our Father. You being the daddy of your children, would you make any of them do wrong or make them do stuff to hurt themselves? No. Well, our father is no different. He would never do something to make us hurt ourselves. But these other Elohim will. And this one that Moses is talking to right here will do this exactly. Principalities and powers have the sole job of making us do evil or do destructive stuff. And they are considered the Elohim too. So that's why we have to make the distinction. Verse four says, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. So here it is still talking about this Elohim here. Not necessarily the most high because he has no recollection of time whatsoever. Time doesn't even exist on that dimension whatsoever. He doesn't age at all. Whereas these other Elohim, some of them actually spent time in our dimension. So they do have a recollection of time. But as E equals MC squared, when they shed their mortal bodies and return to the spirit world, time moves a lot differently. And a thousand years would pass by just as a day would. But verse 5 says, Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. So here is a bit of a change. You see now it's talking about they and them. And how they are being carried away with a flood. Again, we have to make the distinction that this is not our Heavenly Father. This is referring to the flood of Noah. And if you can't make the distinction between these Elohim and the Most High, then you will be blaming our Father for killing those billions of people that died back there in Noah's flood. And you will also blame him for the children that died there in Egypt. That wasn't the Most High. That was the angel of death who is part of the Elohim and in the scripture, you're going to see him being called Lord in some places. Verse six says, in the morning, it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening, it is cut down and withereth. Still talking about all of these people that are being destroyed here. There's a lot of people who want to say that there was an Old Testament God that was vengeful and violent. No, those were the Elohim that were making sure that their people got their just desserts. Our father's role in all of that was giving us his word to protect us and save us through all of that. Teaching us what it is that we're supposed to do so we don't have to worry about those other Elohim. Verse 7 says, For we are consumed by thine anger and by thy wrath we are troubled. See how having a limited vocabulary of these words can lead one to think of our father as being angry or wrathful, or ready to destroy us, putting us on the same page as those blasphemers who act like our father only wants to kill us when the opposite is true. He's trying to protect us and save us from ourselves. Verse 8 says, Thou hast set our inequities before thee, our secret sins and our light of thy continence. See, our father doesn't remember our inequities. They don't matter to him. I mean, we're just hurting ourselves. So why would he care? Other than wanted us to keep us from hurting ourselves. We don't hurt him when we do bad stuff. We only bring trouble on ourselves. Verse 9 says, For all of our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. Still yet talking about these Elohim who will lead us to destruction based on our behavior and our just desserts. 
Verse 10 says, The days of our years are threescore and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Now, there's a lot of people who need to get their heads wrapped around this phrase here. We fly away because there's a lot of other ministers who don't fit the characteristics of who we're talking about here who are getting you prepared to fly away. But notice here in this verse who it is that are flying away. Those who have exceeded their years here on earth. In other words, they're going to go into the spirit world. But anyway, verse 11 says, Whoso knoweth the power of thine anger, even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. But remember, it wasn't until verse 13 that we actually hear from our father. So who is this Elohim that is talking about here? Probably the same one that killed all of those babies back there in Egypt. Verse 12 says, so teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Verse 13 says, Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent the coming concerning thy servants. So notice the difference here. Whereas before it was speaking of these wrathful individuals. It seemed like all it was talking about was wrath and anger. But now he's speaking about the return. And now he's asking how long, but this again is the verse that we saw where it was giving us the yad he wad he or the YHWH, the Tetragrammaton. This is talking about the Most High here as Moses is talking about his return. So when you think about this, it's kind of like Moses is speaking about everybody. He's talking about these Elohim, which would include the Most High. But he's talking about them in the earlier parts of the chapter. And after he's finished or at least gotten to this point, now he's saying, how long, Father, are you going to be away before you come to save us and save us from these other Elohim who would otherwise lead us to our destruction again based on our own just deserts? We have to remember that. Verse 14 says, O oh, satisfy us early with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. So again, this is pointing back here to what we saw in 13. This is a different character, and you can see the tone Moses has is different. He's talking about mercy instead of wrath. And that's because he's talking to the Yahweh Wahe, opposed to the Allah or the Elohim. Verse 15 says, Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Again, talking about making us glad. Verse 16 says, Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto thy children. Still a different tone here, because it's talking to a different person. Or a different being, I should say. The Most High. Now let's look at verse 17. It says, And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of thy hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. So we look back over here at the interlinear. It says, And let be the beauty of Yahweh, of Adonai, our Elohim. So it's kind of rounding it out there. And that's the point of this new song is that it's addressing all of these Elohim. And that's why it is that the 144,000 will be the only group that can learn this is because they are these virgins. They're not connected or married to these false doctrines. So it's going to be easier for them to understand and separate these different Elohim, pulling them out now. They're not bad guys and their job is extremely necessary. So we don't want to be blasphemous even toward these lower level gods. But we do have to recognize that they're different. They're not the most high. They're not the supreme entity. These other lower level gods are servants 
to the Most High. And they do his bidding and do his will just as we will one day when we go on to these higher level mansions or these higher dimensions. So one last look over here in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 3. We can see how Moses was addressing all of these individuals. These thrones, those are Elohim. These are a particular class of angels. The thrones are just like these four beasts are. They're considered Elohim too, but not the most high. They are a specific class of angelic figure, as well as these elders here. And I'm sure if we'd have spent more time in Psalms 90, we could have pulled out each one of these groups. Maybe we'll do that in a future video. So make sure you've subscribed. Go ahead and hit that like button. Please leave a comment below and I will see you down there. Shalom.